Thank you very much for inviting me here. It's great to be here. And uh, originally the title of my talk was Lipids and Metabolites, but I realized what uh, it's uh, not enough time to even talk about lipids. So if you want to hear about metabolites, you have to invite me one more time. Uh, so lipids uh, uh, constitute most of our brain's uh, dry mass. Of course, most of our brains are water. So some people ask me, why don't you study water if there is so much water in brain? <laughs> And, uh, but uh, next after water, it's not proteins as usually for other organs, but it's uh, lipids and lipids are important for brain functions because everything substantial in brain happens on membranes and membranes are made out of lipids. And uh, as usually we make our task more simple, we're not saying, oh, we're going to understand how human brain works. We just are saying we want to understand what makes our brain different from brains of other animals which is much simpler because as, we'll, as you heard and you will hear, actually lots of things in our brain is shared to other, other primates or to mice or to other species. But if we understand uh, what makes us different, then it gives us some chance to understand how human brain works. Uh, technically, looking at lipids is very simple using mass spectrometry. Uh, you, mass spectrometry exists for more, more than 100 years, so you might wonder why we don't know everything about lipids already, because let's say high throughput sequencing has been around for just a bit more than few, well, less than two decades, and we know a lot about the uh, genome already. But um, actually, you will find what there is surprisingly little known. If I'm asking you now, if you would guess, or do you know how brains, uh, how lipids in different brain regions, so in human brain compared to monkey brain, are they different? I guess most of you would guess there are differences, but you probably haven't read it in the textbook because there is no such information in the textbook. So that's what we started from. We started from, uh, and I will show several studies. Actually, most of it is unpublished because we're doing it quite recently. But I start with a study which we did in, uh, already uh, three years ago, which is a long time for lipid research, and it was uh, brains of uh, humans, uh, ch chimpanzees, uh, macaques, and mice, and we had three different brain regions, and we also had other organs, kidney and muscle, because we wanted to compare brain to non-brain uh, tissue. You can see here prefrontal cortex, primary visual cortex, cerebellum, very different brain regions, because we were not sure what we'll see. And we saw this, here is the red, uh, the, the red it is, the more similar it is, so you can see this big red blob is three different brain regions, but they're actually different. They are clearly different from each other, even in a very simple lipidome analysis. Here is about 4,000 different compounds, so it's quite a lot of compounds already. And uh, this is muscle and kidney, and muscle and kidney are also quite different from one another, but not as different as they are from brain. So brain is very distinct, and uh, you might feel like, of course, I just told you brain is mostly made of lipids, so it should be distinct. But actually here we're not looking at the quality, we're looking at what is it made of. And if we're looking at the lipids which have high concentration in brain, they are called BE lipids here, brain and rich lipids, they, because they, we cannot say they're specific to brain, they actually fewer of them, there's just one and a half thousand, this number shows how many compounds is here. And if we look at the brain depleted ones, which are actually high in kidney and muscle and uh, low concentration in brain, there is almost 3,000. So actually, it's not true to say, oh, our brain just has a lot of different lipids. Our brain has specific lipid composition, but it's not more enriched in different lipid types, at least on the first glance, as other tissues. But what is interesting with difference between brain and non-brain is the, the largest in human. And this scale is not very dramatic. It looks dramatic, but actually a few percent different. But it's still interesting what it goes down to human, to chimp and macaques, and then to mouse. So how much lipidome of the brain is specific to brain is the uh, most pronounced in humans compared to other three species. But what is even more interesting for us, how quickly brains change their concentration between species. Because we can say, well, maybe it's a slight change, but mostly, you know, lipids are lipids. These are membranes, so they should be the same in all species. And it was really a shocking surprise for us to see in this work what if we look at the brain and rich lipids, 35% of them change their concentration significantly among these species. These are uh, four different species. And actually a lot of this happened on the human lineage. So this kind of uh, dark red uh, uh, 
rectangle here shows you the proportion of changes which happened on the human lineage compared to chimpanzee lineage. So it's much more, and in general it's a lot. And here, as a comparison with uh, lipids which are present in kidney and muscle, but not so much in brain. And for them, there's exactly the same proportion of change on two lineages, as we expect, because there was a, the same evolutionary time, and the proportion is much smaller. So brain lipids actually change their concentrations very rapidly. And uh, this is uh, what we learned from this first study. So there are brain differences in our from brain to other tissues, which was kind of known before, but not to the same level of detail as we learned, where different brain regions have distinct lipidome composition, and brain lipidome evolves rapidly. <clears throat> so taken from there, we can say, okay, well, uh, this is looking at the adult brain, but our brain changes with age enormously. So would, uh, would this kind of lipidome or lipid whatever composition or fat composition of our brain stays the same at the same age. And for this we looked actually, it's not in a chronological order, but I show you the study which is not yet uh, published. This is looking at uh, humans only. Don't worry, we will get to other primates as well, so there will be evolutionary part. Uh, but humans, we can get more samples. We looked at about uh, 400 individuals, all brain, prefrontal cortex, so here just one brain region, because it would be very hard to get more brain regions from these guys, they wouldn't agree. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm kidding, they're all bad. Uh, so it's from the birth to about 100 years old. And if you look at the lipidome composition, then uh, you can see what this shows the proportion of change per year, because we have 400 individuals, so we can see how lipid composition of the brain change every year. So in the first few years, there's a tremendous amount of changes. So more, almost every lipid in the brain change their concentration, which is not surprising because brain is growing, prefrontal cortex is growing. There are many things happening inside in terms of synaptic connectivity and other stuff. And then it kind of stabilized, and then with aging, uh, there is more things happen. And if we look at, if we can actually look at the whole thing, we see what there is a cluster in four discrete stages. The infant stage is the first 100 days, then the baby stage approximately uh, till six years of age, then from six to 30 years, and from 30 to 100 years. So our brain is actually, in terms of lipidome, our prefrontal cortex experienced with four distinct, uh, uh, fairly distinct lipidome stages. What it means functionally, we have no idea. One can imagine it coincides with some kind of physiological landmarks. But if we look at the later stage, the aging stage, it's also not homogeneous. So this is what actually happening. So this is the curves which show the, the concentrations of uh, lipid compounds here, 150 compounds, 133 compounds. There are dots which show individuals. You can see there is a lot of variability, but we have lots of individuals. So we can see general trends because uh, there is a lot of questions how representative it is. Well, you can see the variability and the trends, there's nothing hidden. But what I want to show you here, in many cases you have some kind of break point, uh, which happens, this is between 30 and 100 years of life. And with break points, if we plot them, uh, they're all, not all, but most of them cluster around 50 to 55 years of age. And this is funny because there was a paper a few years ago uh, also looking at about uh, 600 individuals, but just at the metabolic uh, parameters, at the fat-free mass, uh, fat mass, uh, basal energy expenditure, other energy expenditure parameters. And basically, they also looked for breakpoints. This BP stands for breakpoints, and this is taken directly from their paper, from uh, this paper published uh, a few years ago. And actually, they saw breakpoint at mostly the same time. So this is actually, very surprising because we thought brain would be fairly isolated metabolically from other tissues. You know, brain has very specific metabolism. It consumes just glucose. It has brain blood barrier. And what happens in brain metabolically, theoretically, should be fairly well shielded from the rest of the body. But it seems to be not the case. We have this very clear break point in terms of brain lipidome composition. And it really fairly well coincides with this kind of organismal break point. What we also see very clearly with age is the change in uh, membrane fluidity. Membranes could be very structured, very dense, 
uh, or more fluid. This affects the, how well proteins diffuse, how they can geometry of membrane and other properties. And here the redder it is the more fluid or more disorganized, if you will, uh, is. And you can see there is actually a very clear trend from the young brain to the older brain to be more and more fluid. Uh, again, we cannot explain this whether it's a good or bad thing. We cannot say at the moment because we know so little about the lipids. If you can, if you have some ideas, please tell me after this lecture. Uh, but uh, as I promised, we'll compare we compared uh, humans to chimpanzees and macaques, what we usually do, but here we only had 40 individuals because we don't have 400 chimpanzees and 400 macaques. And it's mostly development, so there's a lot of points at the young age because there's a lot of changes happening. Uh, again, we're looking at the thousands of compounds. And uh, again, lipids uh, change a lot. This is principal component analysis, actually. Well, something similar is multidimensional scaling, and the lighter colors represent uh, young individuals. I, I'm sorry, you cannot see these points very clearly, but basically you can trust me already based on previous results, there's a lot of change with age, especially during young age. But uh, what is interesting, we compare it to changes in messenger RNA and non-coding RNA over age, and we see in all species lipids change more, so the proportion of variance explain, explained by lipidome changes is greater. So uh, actually all of us used to say, oh, gene expression change in development a lot. But actually when we look at lipid concentrations, there's even more changes. So the amplitude as the number of changes is greater. And it's mostly conserved between species, as you can see. But still, uh, there are differences. But what is uh, funny, what, because there are so many lipidome changes with age, we can use uh, lipid concentrations as very accurate age predictors. This is actually, for humans, we can have just on based on 27 lipids, we can predict the age of individuals plus minus one and a half years. So it's much better than, let's say, DNA methylation, which is used in forensics or facial morphology, which is also can be used as an uh, age predictor. As the same is for chimps and macaque, it's even better because they're shorter lifespan, so we can, we can, the changes are faster. So for macaques, you cannot see here, but it's plus minus more or less half year. So if we find the human brain, Somewhere in your lab, we can uh, know what was the age of the individual it came from, at least for prefrontal cortex. And most interesting, human-specific and chimpanzee-specific uh, differences. So you can see this is uh, background, this is the curve showing distribution of human-specific differences in lipidome with age, and this is chimpanzee-specific differences. You can see in er early age, actually both humans and chimpanzees shows a lot of species-specific changes. We think maybe it's related something to feeding because uh, milk and how they fed or whatever, we don't know, but it's our hypothesis. But if, interestingly for humans, this kind of excess of human specific differences compared to background, it stay, stays also for adult age. So if we subtract the two curves, we actually see a very clear bump here between 25, 20, 25 and 30, 35 years of age. Again, I'm not saying was well, there something bad happening later, but it's uh, what uh, very preliminary analysis of lipidome changes in prefrontal cortex tells us. So conclusion here, what uh, there are a lot of differences in ages, in aging, in development. There are four discrete endogenetic stages from what we saw based on 400 individuals. Maybe if we had 4,000 individuals, we can recognize more stages and the maximal difference uh, between human-specific and chimpanzee-specific changes is uh, 20 to 35. And uh, finally, not finally, this is actually one before last, uh, the big project we're doing now, we decided uh, many people doing different kinds of brain maps, so we decided not to be left behind and also do a brain map, and this is a lipid brain map. We took uh, adult humans, we took chimpanzees, macaques, we also took bonobos, which are relatives of chimpanzees. And we're looking at a lot of uh, lipids, and we're also doing uh, RNA-seq, because RNA-seq is easy. Lipids is what we do. This is how samples look like. So this is actually chimpanzee brain sliced, and we can cut specific regions. So, and measure lipids and RNA in the specific regions. Then if you do clustering, you get some specific clusters for lipids and specific clusters for brain regions. Where 
you can see colors here represent normalized concentrations. Here is the membrane fluidity, here is other, other things. Uh, but most importantly, how it looks on, on the actual brain map. On the actual brain map, it looks like this. So we have these different modules, so different clusters. And one of them, the first one is cerebellar one, which is not surprising, cerebellum is very different. Then we have the cortical modules with one, two, three, four. This is basically neocortex. Then we have uh, module five, which is all kind of close subcortical one. Uh, six, seven, eight is uh, basal ganglia and subcortical regions, thalamus. And module nine is white matter. So module nine is this kind of, uh, I don't know, raspberry color. So, and it will be important, please remember this uh, raspberry colored model. And also the yellow one, which is cerebellum. And this is how, if we make the, again, the plots, multi-dimensional scaling plots for the RNA and lipids. For RNA, we are not the first ones to do RNA map. This is very nice map. You can see the cortical regions with three different modules grouped together. Here's white matter, here's cerebellum, here's subcortical regions. In lipids, it's a little bit more fuzzy, but you still can see white matter, of course. But here, you can see cerebellum is actually not where it's supposed to be. It's somewhere here with the cortex. And actually, this is a real effect. So if we, you look at the similarity between lipid and RNA uh, distances on these brain maps, for most of the regions, it's more or less quite similar. So one is the maximal similarity, zero is uh, no similarity. But you can see cerebellum here with yellow dot. And actually, the most dissimilar one is primary motor cortex. We don't understand why. But it has absolutely different uh, organization in terms of uh, lipids uh, in, in compared to other cortical regions. Well, not absolutely different, but quite different. Uh, but uh, of course, most interestingly, again, for us to look at the human-specific differences, what makes lipids in different regions different. And what do you think? Which, which region would be the most human-specific for lipids? Hmm? Prefrontal cortex. Uh, well, so what you see here is actually the number of human-specific uh, lipids. This is the actual number. And uh, blue ones, it's compared to chimpanzee. Green ones compared to bonobo. As expected, they show good agreement. And here you can see this uh, color, this uh, raspberry color. And remember, raspberry color, it's a white matter. So actually, white matter in there is 64 got in, but it's actually it's the basal ganglia mostly. Uh, so actually, this is not prefrontal cortex at all. But uh, don't, don't hurry. I'm actually, it's not yet the final answer. And if we look at the RNA, we, look, we see actually surprisingly very similar. So cerebellum also got in here, but it's also mostly white matter and the basal, basal, uh, basal ganglia regions and thalamus. But uh, what is actually, we need to correct for evolutionary speed because maybe some of these regions just fast evolving, so they will also have a lot of chimpanzee-specific differences. So we need to subtract human-specific ones from the chimpanzee-specific ones to basically say where this branch is much longer than this branch. And if we do that, we actually get two prefrontal cortical regions completely correct uh, on, uh, on a map. They, they win in the competition. And this is this uh, uh, medial prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate cortex. There's two guys. And uh, I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm a molecular biologist. But uh, from what I heard, this is uh, fairly interesting in terms of function, although, again, this is something I would like to be educated about. But uh, still, with uh, two very clearly raspberry-colored regions, they still stay on top, and 68, which is thalamus, still stays on top. So it's not only prefrontal cortex, but surprisingly, the connecting matter, uh, which uh, have a lot of human-specific changes. And if we look at the cluster level, at this module level, Actually, as a, as a module, this uh, module nine, the raspberry colored one, is still the most human specific one. So the white matter is the one that changed the most in the, on the human lineage compared to both chimpanzees and uh, bonobos. And the second one is this light blue one, which is prefrontal one and mostly medial prefrontal one. So this is something we didn't uh, immediately expect. We also tried to use this kind of uh, networks from fMRI to see if the lipids in these regions in this network, there's a lot of different 
uh, annotation for networks. Again, if you guys can tell me which ones are correct, because we just put all of them now, and you can see there are several visual networks, several default networks. But generally speaking, you can see there's more blue here than pink on top, and the blue ones is the ones with advanced quantity, advanced uh, involved in advanced uh, uh, functions such as speech and uh, some kind of um, compre complicated reasoning. And uh, if we look for lipids, which actually involved in this white matter on this network, this is mostly phosphatidyl ethylamines. Uh, these are with how they look like. I actually have no idea why. And I don't think if anybody can tell me, but they, they come up as the top ones in this analysis. So this is what we got so far, brain uh, lipids group by regions, which is not surprising, but white matter and medial prefrontal cortex evolved the most on the human lineage. So this is clear from the lipid perspective because it's pretty comprehensive brain map. Why, I don't know. And very last, I actually, did, it's a kind of uh, very short thing. I wanted to introduce you something very crazy what we did. Uh, it's about brain lipids and behavior. There are foxes here, and uh, these are foxes from Novosibirsk, and there are foxes, uh, minks, and rats from Novosibirsk, which were selected to be aggressive or tame toward human. And there are also species which were selected by our ancestors to be wild or domestic. Here you can see rabbits, pigs, uh, wolves and dogs, and the, uh, what is it? Ah, this kind of animal. And uh, I, uh, my sister used to have one, but uh, I, don't, I forgot how they called in English. You, you know what they are. And we're also interested, of course, how it is in primates. And uh, we looked at the lipids again, a little bit at metabolites. And uh, absolutely shockingly, we found uh, compounds which define, which separate wild from domestic animals, tame from aggressive. And even more shocking, these features, with uh, lipid features correlate. It's, you can see this is not very convincing correlation plot, but it is significant. And this is actually, we didn't expect to see any correlation. But we see, and we've, if we take these guys here, which uh, shows the most agreement, and look at the humans versus uh, other primates, we also get significant results. And human is the most tame of the four. I don't know if it's true based on our history, but it seems what uh, lipids tell us. So the main conclusion I want to give you, lipids are cool. Uh, I think I'm the only one talking about lipids in these three days, so I hope, uh, I hope you will believe me what it's nice to study. Thanks to all, to all collaborators, which I a lot, and all lab members, and thank you all for attending. Well, uh, I don't know how to, because we have people who... Do you have any idea what goes on in embryonic and fetal life, uh, especially in terms of fluidity of the lipids? Yeah, it's a very, very good question, because, um, uh, of course, most likely a lot is happening there. But um, we now got samples for humans, so we're going to measure that. But we don't have any samples, of course, for chimpanzees. It would be impossible to get it. It's just really impossible. So maybe we can compare to macaques or just look at humans. This is something which maybe I can show you in two years. Um, so over here. How, how many of the changes, both in evolution and during age, are driven by changes in the amount of different cell types in the different brain regions? So. Presumably, certain type of neurons have different membrane properties and therefore carry different lipids. And so how much is that and how much is uh, really changes within the same cells? That's a very good question because actually uh, for genes, you can easily answer it by looking at the genes specific to neurons. For lipids, there is no such knowledge. So we try to do deconvolution based on gene expression and then uh, correlate it with uh, uh, with what we see on the lipid level. And for the changes over age, for instance, with myelination, we can see what uh, maybe 10 to 15% of the changes we see in development is explained by myelination. But this is all we got so far, because we, actually this is also what we want to do, to look at specific markers of specific cell types. 
some kind of atlas of lipids for different uh, types of cells in the brain. Can you say something about the separation between uh, lipid heads and lipid chains? Again, I don't know where you, most of the chains you find are. In our analysis, we look at the intact lipids. So we just detect compounds without fragmentation. We do fragmentations, fragmentation if we want to annotate them, but not for all of them. So all results I shown is for intact lipids. So um, some of them are summarized in, in lipid classes, but this is based on annotating them and putting them into classes. <coughs> okay, so last question. Thank you. Is there any information on the difference of functionality in different kinds of lipids? Well, uh, we, on a very basic level, we know what, uh, for instance, we know which, uh, uh, how membranes uh, affect membrane fluidity. So how lipids affect membrane fluidity, so make it more rigid, and I showed some results for that. Uh, we can potentially predict a little bit about geometry, but if you think about it, the membranes, especially of synaptic connections, are incredibly dynamic. There's so, because all this uh, signaling, it happens at the high frequencies, and every time, you know, there is uh, some membrane action. Uh, and it's not only about synaptic connections. We didn't look at synaptic connections yet, so I cannot say anything specifically. So it's actually, um, what I want to say, there's a lot of interesting stuff, I think. But we really just started to approach the surface of it. And this is a little bit frustrating because you get all these differences. And with genes, you can have, like in the previous, you show this wonderful tool and you can immediately see these genes are uh, overrepresented in the certain organs. But for lipids, you cannot do anything like this. There's no annotation at the moment. And this is something, we're just at the very beginning of the process. But I think we will find a lot of cool stuff. Okay, okay, so uh, thank you. Thank and you. maybe while uh, Nomi is uh, putting her computer, so I can ask uh, one last question, please. Um, I wondered if uh, you can attribute some of the changes of the lipids to the enzymes that are involved, to degradation biosynthesis, and some are due to uh, possibly oxidative uh, reactions that occur at later ages. Yes, yeah, so um, it's actually two questions. First of all, yes. can we link it to enzymes? Yes. Yes. So we can see correlations. Um, for lipids, it's a little tricky because there are one enzyme controls many steps and many processes. But we see correlations between enzyme concentration and their products. Oxidation and aging. So we specifically looked if there is an increase of byproducts in aging. There is no increase. Mm. So this is actually good news. I didn't talk about it because it's a little bit separate topic. But uh, there is this hypothesis. There is this build a metabolic breakdown in aging. So yeah. we will see a lot of kind of garbage byproducts, we would see them in our analysis, but we don't. So the amount of compounds we see in prefrontal cortex in uh, uh, 100 year old, old person and 20 years old person, more or less the same. So, and there is no indication what their shift towards more garbage. Okay, good news. Thank you yes. very much. Okay.